Our text today is read from the 15th chapter of Revelation, beginning with verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy, for all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened, and the seven angels came out of the temple, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials, full of the wrath of God, who liveth and abideth forever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God, from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the plague of the seven angels was, were fulfilled. Till the plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The wrath of God and the vengeance of God is poured out against the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, and all those who oppose God and persecute his people. I don't know what goes on in the legislatures of all the countries where this program is heard, but in my country, in our legislatures, the legislation of congressmen and senators, the ruling in courts, the teaching in our schools, all consists in blasphemy against God the Creator. It is all designed to ridicule morality, decency, and the normal heterosexual lifestyle that God commanded in Genesis and warned against departing from. It's all about lying against the truth, presenting demented, disgusting, false, deliberately contrived theories of origins to subvert the story of the creation by God, our great maker, creator, and deliverer. And what is the consequence of all of this? We have the plague of AIDS, the divine judgment of AIDS visited upon our society. And there are other forms of disease, too, and some of them related threatening to devastate our country with no real view of prevention or cure in sight. Homes and lives are in complete disarray. Marriages have lost their meaning. Children are the pitiful victims of these so-called homes. These are the commentaries on our times. There are other urgent problems. There's the problem of drugs that cannot be solved the threats from radiations and chemicals and contamination, the completely out-of-control violence in the streets that causes law enforcement to run for cover, to admit that they don't know what to do, they don't have the money and the manpower to do it if they did, and there's no public support. Every time they knock one of these criminals in the head, somebody wants them pulled off the, the police force and tried. Terrible problems. And what reaction do we get to all of this? They gnaw their tongues in anger, or in anguish, the Bible says a little later on, 
but they will not repent. They throw up their hands and wring their hands and wag their heads and discuss in fearful and unbelieving tones the problems that are out of control. Seminars and town hall meetings are held. Committees are appointed to study the problem. And everyone admits that something has gone haywire. Something went wrong, terribly wrong, somewhere. There's a general acknowledgement that this situation cannot continue like this. It's devastating us, and we just simply can't live with it. We've got to do something about it. Still, in our legislatures, administrations, courts, and law enforcement bodies, not one single voice is raised advocating national repentance and a return to God and to his moral law. No one is willing to admit that this is the problem. It all started happening when we turned from the Ten Commandments as the basis of our social law, when we destroyed in our universities and philosophy classes absolute rights and absolute wrongs in the minds of the people, and when they studied and well-financed program went about to undermine authority and discipline. Now, perhaps you object to branding our national leaders as fools, but I submit to you that it's no more objectionable than labeling Pharaoh the king of Egypt as a stupid man. Pharaoh the king of Egypt was the greatest leader and the wealthiest man and the most powerful man in the most powerful nation in the world. This was a nation that once ruled in the days of Abraham and Isaac by men who feared God and his laws. The Pharaoh of Egypt had once scolded Abraham for not telling him that Sarah was his wife and almost allowing Pharaoh to commit the unthinkable sin of adultery, thus incurring the wrath of God. Compare that king to our presidents in recent times. But now they had come to blasphemy, Egypt had, false religion and superstitions as to man's origins and destiny and what was right and what was wrong. Now Pharaoh of Egypt was leading his people in vile practices that included, among other things, human sacrifices. Not too much different from abortion. Like the leaders of our nation today, he too thought that he did not need God and that he had both the right and the ability to bow up his neck and resist God. Well, of course, we know the story. Egypt was destroyed and never again came to world prominence. But was Pharaoh stupid? Was he a fool? Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Asked this heavenly host. For thou alone art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. Why don't men repent? Why don't they recognize what is causing all of this? Why don't they go to the root cause and cut it off at the source? Why don't they eliminate from society the criminals who are destroying society? Why do they not rid legislatures, courts, and schools of the blasphemers who are deliberately and maliciously twisting people's heads? If they would do this, the plague could be stopped and society could heal up. But they will not do it. They wring their hands and gnaw their tongues in anguish. They will put dust on their heads and sit down in sackcloth and ashes and bewail the situation and pity themselves. But there are no elders in the gates calling for repentance and return to God. Now, a society cannot accept Christ and be saved. Only individuals can do that. But a government could, in theory at least, return to the moral law and a reverence to God? Well, they could, but they won't. And so this nation will go the way of history. I do not relate these things in the hope of encouraging national repentance. I do it in obedience to the task to teach this book. 
for information for the church as to what is happening and why. If you want to waste your time and frustrate yourself in the process, spend it in praying for this country's deliverance from judgment. It's a complete waste of time and emotion. If you think that God is going to listen to that kind of ill-advised request while these queers, blasphemers, and rebels and murderers are sitting in their theaters, their lecture halls, their senates, and their gay bathhouses, sneering at truth and spitting at the heavens, then you're a bigger fool than they are. Leave God alone and let him get rid of this mess so we can get on home. Don't be like Lot's wife in Sodom and hang on to the lamppost while he's trying to drag you out of here. No, there is no repentance. The saddest of all is the fact that they will not do so because they cannot do so. Only the called and chosen and faithful turn to God. In this present and last earthly dispensation of time, there is a difference between the kingdom of God which is not of this world and the kingdoms of this world which are doomed to death and destruction along with the dragon and the beast and the false prophet. And after that I looked and behold the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open. The Greek word here for temple means a secret or a sacred place. In this secret and sacred place is the tabernacle of the testimony of the covenant. In the book of Exodus in the Old Testament, God commanded the nation of Israel to build a tabernacle in the wilderness. The word tabernacle essentially means a tent. It was a temporary building that was designed to be put up and taken down and easily moved from place to place. The tabernacle had a number of important features, but the most important feature of the tabernacle was that it housed the testimony. In that ark of the testament were a golden pot containing manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tables of the law, in other words, the Ten Commandments, written by the finger of God. These were in the Ark of the Covenant, which was made of desert acacia wood and was overlaid with gold. That is symbolism we can't go into now. It had a lid called the mercy seat, which was guarded by two golden cherubim, one on either side of it. It was in this mercy seat, between the cherubim, in the holiest of all, that God met with the children of Israel. In fact, it was called the Tent of Meeting. He met there with them when Israel was in the wilderness and long after that. The tabernacle was a temporary building that was to find its permanent fulfillment, not in Solomon's temple, as many suppose, for that was David's idea, not God's, but in the heavenly tabernacle. But the temporariness of the tent had another prophetic meaning. It testified of the church, the holy dwelling place of God through the Spirit, according to the second chapter of Ephesians. The church in this world is, as St. Peter said in Second Peter, the second chapter, a temporary dwelling place of God until the work of the kingdom is complete, the mortal earth is destroyed and reborn in immortality, and the permanent home of the bride of Christ is established forever. And so it is in the church that God resides at the present time in this world. It is in this temporary tabernacle, which is the church, that the righteous laws of God are upheld. It's where God is. It's where truth is to be found. And it is the only place that they are to be found in this world at this present time. Now, the seven angels, the church, the faithful, come out of that secret place armed with a mission. The temple of God is a place of refuge and safety, but it's also, in this dispensation, a war room of judgment, justice, righteousness, and wrath. In order to be involved in this work, and more specifically this battle, each servant had to be clothed in white. 
Well, this is the righteousness of Christ, but it's also the personal righteousness of the saints obtained by faith and through obedience in sanctification. Now, these seven angels are the same as the seven angels of the churches and the seven angels blowing the seven trumpets. They are the seven golden candlesticks, or in other words, the church on her mission. They are divinely empowered, equipped, and outfitted to do this priestly work. They have on a golden girdle or the golden ephod. Now, this teaches us about a specific aspect of the righteous war. The ephod or the girdle identifies the believer priest going out to do intercessory work. The gold, standing for deity or divinity, shows that this is the power of God, the leading of the Holy Ghost, and the righteousness of Christ. Part of this work is done, and this battle is made, by the avenging of God's faithful and the visiting of wrath upon the kingdom of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. This is a residual work, not a direct or objective work of the church but it is a divinely appointed consequence that is accomplished by the word of the church in the preaching of the gospel. They are given golden vials. When the golden vial first appears in the book of Revelation, they are said to contain incense and also the prayers of the saints. It's no coincidence that the book of Revelation talks about the Song of Moses. In Exodus 2 and verses 23 through 25, we read how it came to pass in the process of time that the king of Egypt died and the children of Israel sighed by reason of the bondage and they cried and their cry came up before God by reason of their bondage and God heard the groaning and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob and God looked upon the children of Israel and God had Respect unto them. The Pharaoh who knew and was kind to Joseph had died, and another Pharaoh assumed command that did not know Joseph. He began to persecute the children of Israel because he was worried about the strength of their numbers. He was afraid that they would join his enemies and in this way escape from Egypt, thus depriving them of this great slave labor force which was the source of their wealth. So he began to kill off the male children and otherwise oppress them. It is here, as we read, that the prayers of the children of Israel came up to the ears of God, and he heard their sighing, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, and so he called Moses from the backside of the desert to deliver his children. Now we've already noted in Revelation 8, 5, how the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth, and there were voices and thunderings, and lightnings, and an earthquake. Marvelous and fearful activities originate from the throne of God. When the vials of incense are poured out upon the golden altar, and the prayers of the saints go up to God. This language signifies the lives of God's people poured out in sacrifice, suffering, and death for the kingdom of God, a goodly part of which is brought on by the opposition and persecution of blasphemers and ungodly men. Now God, filled with wrath and indignation, is going to avenge his people, and he is also going to avenge himself from the blasphemy of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. In verse 7, we are reminded again that God is eternal, immortal, immutable, incorruptible, and perfect in power. One of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven vials filled with the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. This emphasis indicates that the 666, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the last two being symbols for secular humanism and religious humanism, cannot win out over God and cannot destroy him. God's wrath is occasioned by the prayers of the saints, and his wrath is against those who blaspheme him and persecute his people. 
And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. The temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power so that no man was able to enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. We go back again to Exodus and the tabernacle in the wilderness. When it was all set up and ready to go, the smoke came down, the cloud filled the temple, and no man could go into it until the cloud raised. Throughout the Bible, and specifically in the Psalms, the book of Isaiah, and the book of Ezekiel, smoke is identified with God's holiness and wrath. The imagery of Isaiah 6, verses 2 to 6, is very close here. This smoke represents the wrath of God, which presently abides in the holy place until all evil is finally purged forever from creation. Now, this is talking about the physical entering in as the final and completed stage of the outworking of redemption. Men cannot enter into the presence of God until all evil is purged from existence and we are born physically in perfection and immortality. This is the present work of God in the present time. It is a work which is just. It is a work which is merciful. And it is a work which is obviously necessary.